Thanks for joining us on Arirang News. I'm Kim Dami in Seoul. President Yoon suk yeol is set to address the nation this week to explain the status of his five key reforms to improve the national pension, health care system, education, labor conditions and the birth rate. The South Korean government and the ruling party have agreed to supply a record amount of Chuseok-related goods as part of efforts to support people's livelihoods. $30 billion in financial support will also be dished out to back small and medium-sized firms. Israel and Lebanese military group Hezbollah exchanged some of the heaviest cross-border attacks in months over the weekend, involving hundreds of drones and warplanes. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said Sunday's attacks were not the end, signaling more attacks to come. President Yoon suk yeol is set to announce the direction of his government's pension reform as he is set to address the nation in a briefing session this week to update the public on the status of his five key major reforms. Our Oh Soo Young has more. President Yoon suk yeol will push for a new plan to reform the public pension scheme as South Korea's rapidly aging society faces the possible depletion of pension funds within just 30 years. According to various presidential officials over the weekend, Yun will address the nation this week to explain the status of his five key reforms to improve the national pension, healthcare system, education, labour conditions and the birth rate. In his briefing, Yun will mainly set the tone for the government's soon-to-be-announced roadmap for pension reform, the first since 2007. One official told Arirang News that Yun feels he must personally address the issue, recognising that the national pension affects every citizen particularly the younger and future generations. The current structure allows people to receive more than they've paid over the years, causing a deficit. This puts a burden on future generations who have to cover the difference. When the pension system was first introduced, it was designed generously to encourage people to join. It was expected the premium rates would gradually increase and the income replacement rate would decrease over time. However, after the 1997 Asian financial crisis and even during the 2007 pension reform, there were proposals to increase the premium, but they weren't implemented. South Korea having the world's lowest birth rate and a declining population means fewer young adults will have to support the disproportionately large number of pensioners. As experts predict, the current pension funds will run out by 2055. Those born after 1990 would not receive any payouts upon retiring at age 65, despite their decades-long contributions. Previous discussions in Parliament have focused on parametric measures, such as adjusting the insurance premium rate, how much you pay, and how much of your income can be replaced by your pension payout, the so-called income replacement rate. To secure fiscal sustainability and generational equity, the government is likely to increase the premium rate from the current 9% to 13%, which the ruling and opposition parties agreed on earlier this year. However, the new plan is expected to also introduce structural changes by proposing a slower rate of increase for younger people to meet the 13% target, while the older generation would be subject to steeper increments. Other measures being mulled are automatically adjusting premium rates and income replacement levels based on economic and demographic conditions, as well as enhancing benefits for military personnel and new mothers. The truth is, no other country has experienced a birth rate as low as South Korea's, so we need to take more drastic and unprecedented measures to ensure sustainability, intergenerational equity and old age income security. Otherwise, we'll see a divide between those who benefit and those who don't, and the system won't be sustainable. Once the government proposal is submitted to the National Assembly, partisan discussions and social discourse are expected to follow as reform measures require changes to the National Pension Act. Oh Seung, Arirang News. The government and the ruling party have shared a number of measures aimed at easing the cost of living ahead of the Chuseok holidays. The plan includes providing a record amount of high-demand Chuseok items to markets. Our political correspondent Shin ha has the details. As part of efforts to support people's livelihoods ahead of the Korean Thanksgiving holiday, Chuseok, three weeks from now, South Korea will supply a record amount of Chuseok-related goods as well as other incentives. This plan was discussed during a meeting of senior officials from the government, the presidential office and the ruling People Power Party on Sunday. 
We need to focus more on the rising prices of vegetables, fruits, livestock and seafood as these are the areas where people feel the impact the most. 170,000 tons of the 20 most high demand Chuseok items, including cabbage and apples, will be supplied to markets, the largest amount ever for Chuseok holiday. The government and the PPP also agreed to waive highway tolls and offer discounts of up to 40 percent for KTX and SRT train tickets for travelers from the provinces to the capital area during the Chuseok holiday. South Korea plans to provide 40 trillion Korean won, which is around 30 billion U.S. dollars in financial support to small and medium-sized companies as well as small business owners to ease financial pressure, including lowering interest rates for loans. The government has also decided to purchase 50,000 tons of surplus rice from last year from farmers. Additional measures to stabilize falling rice prices will be announced before the middle of September. The PPP also made a request to the government to review designating this year's Armed Forces Day, which is October 1st, as a temporary holiday to honor active military personnel. The government will review factors including stirring up military morale, boosting consumer spending and the impact on businesses before making a decision. Shin ha Arirang News. South Korea's consumer price growth rate is set to slow to the low 2% range, following a rebound of to 2.6% in July, now before stabilizing at around 2% for September. That's according to a Bank of Korea report released on Monday, based on a forecasting model developed by the bank that combines machine learning techniques and bottom-up estimation for an improved prediction of short-term inflation. Agriculture prices will also slow thanks to favorable weather conditions, while the recent drop in global oil prices will be reflected domestically. The rate of increase in prices of core products is expected to slow in the upper 1% range, and the rate of increase for prices of core services, with the exception of housing and rent, are expected to show a moderate slowdown around the mid-2% range level. The number of people aged 60 and older in employment has hit a record figure in South Korea due to the country's aging population. This is according to the Ministry of SMEs and Startups on Monday. Nearly 6.4 million people in this age group were in employment on average monthly between January and July this year, which accounts for more than 22 percent of the total workforce. Now, this is more than four times the ratio that was seen 40 years ago. The number of startups founded by people in that age group between January and May also accounted for nearly 14 percent of the total, marking a new record. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un supervised a performance test of so-called suicide drones last weekend and called for the development of more to boost war readiness. According to the regime's state media on Monday, Kim oversaw the test of the new exploding drones, which are made to precisely destroy preset enemy targets on the ground and in the sea. Two drones were revealed in the photographs, similar to ones used in Israel and Russia. Gim emphasized the need to develop different types of drones and improve combat capabilities for war operations. He also highlighted the importance of incorporating artificial intelligence technology when developing those drones. Tensions are ramping up over in the Middle East as Israel and Hezbollah conducted cross-border attacks consisting of hundreds of rockets and fighter jets. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu warned of more attacks if necessary. Our Moon Hedian reports. Israel and Lebanese militant group Hezbollah exchanged their most intense fire in months, but pulled back despite fears from the international community of escalation into a wider war. On Sunday morning, air raid sirens rang through northern Israel as Hezbollah launched hundreds of rockets and drones in retaliation for Israel's killing of a top militant commander last month. Israel said it carried out a wave of preemptive strikes with a hundred fighter jets to thwart the attacks, with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu claiming that all of Hezbollah's drones were intercepted as a result. Lebanon's health ministry said three people were killed, and both sides stated that they only aimed at military targets with Hezbollah's leader saying that the group targeted a military base near Israel's capital, Tel Aviv, in a televised address on Sunday evening.
Netanyahu warns that this is not the end of the story, while Hezbollah asserted that this was only phase one of its attack on Israel but confirmed attacks were over at this current stage. This follows high-level talks in Egypt on a Gaza hostage and ceasefire deal, which included representatives from Hamas and Israel. Ceasefire talks are set to continue in the coming days, with United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres calling for a cessation of hostilities. But a Hamas delegation has reportedly left Cairo after talks did not reach a resolution on Sunday. The U.S. views the deal as being crucial to de-escalating tensions between Hezbollah and Israel, as the Lebanese militant group has said that it will only stop the hostilities once fighting in Gaza ends. U.S. President Joe Biden was reported to be closely monitoring the situation as it unfolded on Sunday, while U.S. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin ordered two aircraft carrier strike groups to remain in the region and reaffirmed U.S. commitment to defending Israel. The United States was not involved in the strikes directly, but helped track incoming Hezbollah attacks. Hamas congratulated Hezbollah for its major response, while Yemen's Iran-aligned Houthi forces hailed it a courageous attack. Meanwhile, Gaza's health ministry has reported that 71 Palestinians were killed in Israeli operations just preceding the Sunday attacks. It also said that the death toll since the October 7th attacks has reached 40,405, with more than 93,000 Palestinians injured. Udhiryan, Arirang News. And it's been nearly three weeks since Ukraine began its incursion into Russia's Kursk region. While the Russian military strengthens its offense against Ukraine, Kyiv has continued its airstrikes in border in other border regions near Kursk. Yisung Jasmor. On August 6, Ukraine surprised the Kremlin with an incursion and attacks inside Russian territory. It's been nearly three weeks since the Ukrainian forces began operations in the Kursk region, and Kyiv says it's now using a new high-tech drones capable of precision strikes against its enemies. In response to the Ukrainian drone strikes in the southwestern border city of Belgorod, Russian authorities issued a state of emergency in the Volnornez region. Russian officials say five Russian civilians were killed and 12 others injured by the airstrikes. However, the Russian Defense Ministry says its military has things under control and claims it has repelled Ukrainian offensives. Russian defense officials say nearly 40 Ukrainian drones and eight U.S.-made HIMARS missiles were shot down by its air defense system over a 24-hour period from Saturday into Sunday, adding that the Ukrainian military had suffered significant losses. Moscow's defense ministry claims that some 1,900 Ukrainian soldiers were killed in the same 24-hour period inside Russian territory. It also added that it has sent more artillery and missiles to the region in order to repel Ukrainian forces. Meanwhile, Russian forces inside Ukraine continue its offensives on the Eastern Front, with Ukrainians in the Donetsk being evacuated. Ukrainian officials said the Russian airstrikes on a hotel in the region killed the British national and injured two journalists, all reportedly working for Reuters. Lee seung Arirang News. BTS member Suga, who was questioned by the police for driving an electric scooter while under the influence of alcohol, has issued another apology. In a handwritten note posted on the fan community platform Weverse on Sunday, Suga apologized to his fans for his actions. The BTS member also apologized for causing confusion with his first apology earlier this month. Now, after his DUI incident came to spotlight, he was criticized for referring to the electric scooter he drove under the influence as an electric kickboard in a possible attempt to lower the level of punishment. According to the police, Suga fell over while riding an electric scooter on August 6. His blood alcohol content at the time of the accident incident exceeded the level for a one-year license suspension. With the cost of goods seemingly getting more expensive by the day, more of the younger generation are turning to second-hand jobs. This reflects this trend called under-consumption core. Our An Song Jin tells us more. Vintage clothes shopping is like searching for a hidden gem. This vintage pop-up store in the Hongdae area of Seoul says most of its customers are in their 20s and 30s. T-shirts here cost around 4,000 to 5,000 won, which is very cheap, especially for the younger generation, which is still financially dependent. 
Those reasonable prices are also what attracts young people to vintage clothing stores. It's also cheaper most of the times, and sometimes it's even upcycled, so there's a new twist to the item. Yeah, you can also find good items for a lot less money if you, you know, if you look around. This is known as underconsumption core. I talked to a content creator who explains a bit more of this trend in detail. So underconsumption is mindfully consuming less. So whatever you have, just using it to the fullest. So it's a pushback to overconsumption. They started underconsumption. So going to thrift stores would be a form of underconsumption because you're more mindful of what you buy and you bring into your home. It's not only fashion that's been affected by this trend of opting for affordable means. According to the Korea Federation of Bookstore Association, two major second-hand bookstores have seen their number of branches increase each year from 2015 to last year. From vintage clothing to buying second-hand books and furniture, Undercore Consumption claims to reject excessive consumption and pursue a simple lifestyle. A professor adds that there is more to the scope of this trend. People are now moving away from YOLO to YONU, which is you only need one. It ties back to minimalism and advocates for reducing consumption. Buying vintage clothes has already been around for a while, yet it's trending even more among the younger generation these days because in the midst of materialism, such old items seem to appeal to them with history and uniqueness. The steady selling of vintage items not only reflects the younger generation's pursuit for uniqueness, but amid the rising cost of living, it's also a pushback against overconsumption. An Song Jin, Arirang News. Have you ever imagined what it would be like to take a hot air balloon flight in the middle of Seoul City? Well, if you have, you can make that dream a reality with the so-called Seoul Dal. Our cultural correspondent Song Yujin tells us more. It's a typical weekday afternoon in central Seoul. The sun is still high in the sky, but a giant moon begins to rise, slowly making its way above the tall trees and skyscrapers. This isn't just any moon. It's Seoul's first helium balloon ride, Seoul Dal. The name Seoul Dal combines Seoul with Dal, the Korean word for moon. While it may resemble a traditional hot air balloon from the outside, it's different on the inside. The biggest difference compared to a hot air balloon is that a hot air balloon rises by heating air with fire, which causes a hot air to lift the balloon. But in the case of a gas balloon like this, it uses helium a gas lighter than air, to float. Seoul Dal doesn't use fire, making it safer since helium is a non-flammable gas. From Friday, this attraction is open to the public following a six-week trial run. I had the opportunity to take a ride myself. So this is a Seoul Dal, or the Moon of Seoul gas balloon. Follow me for a ride. The way up is both thrilling and a bit nerve-wracking. But the real highlight comes when you reach the top. So after three or four minutes going up, we're now up 130 meters from the ground. Take a look at the view. The 15-minute journey offers a stunning new perspective of Seoul. It's amazing because you get to see the city skyline, parks, the Hangang River, and nature all at once. It really adds to the experience, and I think it's going to become a great tourist attraction. It gives you a much farther view than I expected, which was really different. I'd love to come back here with my parents sometime. Seoul is rising to the challenge, taking on major tourist cities such as Budapest and Paris that offer visitors a similar experience. With innovative attractions like Seoul Dal, the city's ambitious goal of attracting 30 million visitors annually by 2026 doesn't seem far. Seoul has iconic landmarks like In Seoul Tower, Lotte World Tower and Namsan Hanok Village, but finding places that combine fun with unique experiences can be challenging. Seoul Dal offers stunning views of the Hangang River and the city's skyline, much like observation decks in Tokyo and Dubai, but with the added thrill of a balloon ride. For those eager to take this sky-high adventure, Seoul Dal operates every Tuesday to Sunday from noon to 10 p.m. Song Yujin, Arirang News. Let's move on to the world now. 
Solidin, Germany saw protests on Sunday, local time from a far-right organization for the political party Alternative for Germany. This follows the arrest of a 26-year-old Syrian man named as Isa al H, who is accused of a stabbing attack on Friday, which left three people dead and eight injured. The stabbing took place during a festival marking the city's 650th anniversary named the Festival of Diversity. The Islamic State militant group has claimed responsibility for the stabbing attack, saying the act was to avenge Muslims in Palestine and everywhere. Issa handed himself into police in the city of Solinj on Saturday night local time. The far-right protest was met with counter-protests against fascism. In Santa Cruz, Bolivia, volunteer firefighters are fighting the wild bushfires which are threatening the livelihoods of indigenous communities and livestock in the area of Santa Ana. The Chiquitano Forest in Bolivia is currently under threat and locals are doing what they can to save the wildlife while they wait for the authorities to step in. Chief of the Central Paconeca Indigenous Community, Maria Suarez, has expressed her sadness to see animals dying because they have nowhere to eat due to the destruction by the fires. The locals currently have no water to fight off the fires, Suarez continued. Messaging app Telegram stated on Sunday that its founder, Pavel Durov, has nothing to hide following his arrest at the weekend. Telegram dismissed claims that the platform owners should be held responsible for misuse. Durov was arrested at Paris's Le Bourget airport on Saturday local time on charges related to the app's failure to crack down on illegal activity online. Responding to Durov's detention in France, the company emphasised that Telegram complies with EU laws, including the Digital Services Act, and that its moderation is continuously improving. The statement also noted that Durov travels frequently in Europe and expressed hope for a quick resolution. The 2024 Paralympic Games torch arrived in France from the UK through the Chanel Tunnel on Sunday. The relay started the day before in Stoke, Mandeville, England, the birthplace of the Paralympic movement, which was envisioned by neurologist Ludwig Gutmann in 1948. British athletes carried the torch midway through the undersea tunnel, handing it off to French competitors who brought it to Calais. The flame will continue its journey to Paris, where it will light up the Paralympic cauldron during the opening ceremony on Wednesday. Walter Lee, Arirang News. Good afternoon. After a one-night break on Saturday, it was a return to tropical nights last night in Seoul. Jeju has endured 42 tropical nights so far this season, but at least suffocating heat died down compared to last week and in many parts. But we will have to wait until the Chuseok holiday mid-September to feel that autumn breeze. Now keep an umbrella handy again. There is a chance of passing rain with 5 to 40 millimeters in the forecast across much of Korea along with thunderstorms. And this afternoon, Seoul gets up to 31 degrees. Gyeongju will be topping out at 34 degrees Celsius. But humidity will make feels like temperatures a couple of degrees higher. Now, the East Coast and Jeju could be rainy for the next couple of days. Meanwhile, Korea's weather could be affected by Typhoon Shanshan this week. That's forecast to approach western and eastern Japan from Tuesday, which will bring heavy rain and violent winds to Japan. That's Korea for you, and here's a look at the international weather conditions. That's all we have at this hour. Arirang News will be back at 2 p.m. Korea time. Thanks for watching.